How you doing? I'm Tim Sandal and I'm BPL site microbiologist and I'm back with you with another five minutes video and today's subject is autoclaves and with these videos just as a reminder I'm trying to talk about one subject making three key points and going on at you for no longer than five minutes and this is the fourth video in the series. So autoclaves, so the first point I want to make is with how autoclaves kill microorganisms and this is using moist heat and this is the oldest known way of killing or inactivating microorganisms so just think about ancient civilizations discovering they could boil food to stop food poisoning and what we're trying to do with autoclaves is inactivate microorganisms at high temperatures in the presence of steam and the absence of air. So the energy input from steam causes the proteins inside the microorganisms to coagulate, which effectively um, kills them. Works the same on bacteria and on fungi. And this process requires precise control of time, temperature and pressure. OK, my second point is just the basics of how autoclaves work. So it's best to think of the autoclave as essentially a pressure cooker. Now, in your kitchen, you're boiling water and the water will boil around 100 degrees Celsius at around atmospheric pressure. However, at a higher pressure, water will boil at a higher temperature. So by ramping up the pressure to about 10,000 pascals or what used to be called one bar, we can get water to boil at around 121 degrees Celsius. And running this at this temperature for 15 minutes or longer is sufficient to destroy even the toughest of bacterial endospores. And we prove this using spore strips or what's also known as biological indicators. And these use a really heat resistant uh, bacteria, which is isolated from the hot springs that erupt up from Yellowstone Park in the USA. Now, my third point is that sometimes autoclaves don't work too well. So in order to get away from the things that stop autoclaves working badly, is that when you're operating an autoclave, it's important to ensure that all the trapped air is removed before you start the sterilization cycle. And this is because hot air acts as an insulator and this prevents sufficient heat from reaching the microorganisms. Um, so we need to drive the air out, which is through a series of pulses. We also need to get uniformity of heat transfer. So sticking to the validated load patterns is really um, important. If you start varying from the low patterns then um, you're not necessarily going to get the uniform heat transfer that we desire. It's also important that the steam is dry and we talk about something called a steam dryness value and this is steam being at 97 percent or higher because if the dryness value is below this then we get moisture. Moisture leads to wet loads and wet loads um, is non-sterility and it also damages the package integrity as well so packaging breaks and you have non-sterility as well. Now people around BPL sometimes ask me they stop me and say hey Tim how wet is wet in terms of autoclave materials and my answer is always none. You must have no moisture at all. If you do, then the choice, cho choices are that you have a non-sterile material and this is going to put the product and the patient at risk. So wet loads are a big no-no, always reject. OK, that's it. Coming in just under five minutes. As a reminder, I'm Tim Sandal and keep up the good work. You're doing great and uh, enjoy 
the rest of your shift. Until next time, goodbye.